In this video, we will show you how to solve the Dirac equation. For now, we will focus on the rest frame of the particle. We will show you in a different video how to arrive at general solutions. Let's start by reviewing the Dirac equation. d slash is a shorthand notation for gamma mu d mu, which means that we have a 4 times 4 matrix, where the entries are partial derivatives. Since this is a 4 times 4 matrix, we also have an identity matrix here, and the solution psi must be an object with four components. The first step is to use a plane wave ansatz, e to the plus or minus ikx. For every single k, this is a different wave. The idea behind this is that we can later do a linear combination of many of those plane waves to get a general wave function. Now, since the exponential function is just a scalar, we need something to carry the four components we mentioned earlier. These objects are usually called u and v for the minus and plus plane waves, and can in general depend on k. The exponential factor is responsible for the position dependence of psi, whereas u and v express the spin state of psi. Notice that in the case of u, we have an exponential factor of e to the minus i e t, whereas for v, we have e to the plus i e t. The first one is the usual time dependence phase we know from non relativistic quantum mechanics, but the other one apparently has the wrong sign. Historically, this has caused a lot of confusion since it looks like negative energy, but nowadays we interpret these states as antiparticles. Moving on, we now use this plane wave ansatz in the Dirac equation. For psi 1, we get k slash minus m times u is 0. And for psi 2, we get k slash plus m times v is 0. By the way, you can also use such a plane wave ansatz for the adjoint Dirac equation, which leads to those two equations. Now that we have equations for u and v, we would like to know what's inside the four components of u and v. To do this, we now consider the rest frame, where the momentum k is given by m, 0. This means we can write k slash simply as m times gamma 0. Now, since we have 0 on the right side of the equation, we can get rid of the mass and arrive at two very simple looking equations for u and v. In order to continue, we write u explicitly using its four components. But what about gamma 0? The gamma matrices come in many different representations, so depending on which representation of gamma 0 we choose, we'll get a different expression for u and v. First, we use the so-called Dirac representation, or a standard representation of the gamma matrices. In order to remind ourselves which representation we're using, we'll write it on top of the equal sign. In the Dirac representation, gamma 0 is given as a diagonal matrix, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. Using this representation, we get the following set of four equations. We see that c and d must be zero. So u for the rest frame and in the Dirac representation is given by a, b, zero, zero. a and b can, in principle, be any complex number as long as they are correctly normalized. But we don't usually use a and b since it's conventional to write them inside of a two-component object called phi. Now, since phi has two components, there can obviously be two linearly independent versions, for example, 1, 0 and 0, 1. In order to distinguish between those, we add an index s to phi, which can take on two values, 1 and 2. So how do we choose these basis states of phi s? Usually, it's convenient to choose eigenvectors of Pauli matrices. So for example, if there is a magnetic field in z direction, it might be useful to choose phi s as 1, 0 and 0, 1 representing spin up and spin down along the z-axis. But if there is a magnetic field in x-direction, then 1, 1 and 1, minus 1, corresponding to up and down along the x-axis, might be a better choice. Finally, we have to talk about how to call these things. The four-component object u is called a Dirac spinner, or bi-spinner, whereas the two-component object phi is called a while spinner, or just spinner. The equation for v can be solved in a very similar way, which leads us to 0, 0, cd, which we denote using the while spinner eta. And again, depending on the two spin states, v and eta get an index s, which can take on two values. Since v represents an antiparticle, we have to keep one thing in mind. The spin states for up and down are flipped. So for example, eta s can still be chosen in the z basis, but then 1, 0 means spin down and 0, 1 means spin up. 
So far, we've been talking about the direct representation of the gamma matrices. However, there is also another widely used representation called the Weyl representation or chiral representation. Here, gamma zero looks like this. After performing similar steps, we get to the result that the bi spinner u in the Weyl representation reads phi s phi s, and the bi spinner v is eta s minus eta s. Before we end this video, here are three important points. First, be careful about the notation. It might be confusing at first, but be sure to know the difference between Dirac and Weyl spinners and Dirac and Weyl representations. Second, independent of the representation of the gamma matrices, we always have two degrees of freedom, expressed by the choice of s equals 1 or 2. This is because the Dirac equation describes a spin one half particle, which can have spin up or spin down. Third, we haven't talked about the normalization of u and v yet. The details are the topic of a different video, but for now just know that the wild spinners are usually normalized like this. And that's pretty much it for this video. Thanks for watching.